Okay, so thermoregulation in poultry. Uh, so we learned like the mechanisms of thermoregulation. So then I decided to look at, okay, how specifically does this species do it? So um, I look more in chickens than poultry in general. Um, but they have about like five things they do that use those um, thermoregulatory uh, mechanisms. So the first one is they pant, um, like most animals, because they don't have sweat glands. So panting. Um, increases the passage of air in their lungs and it increases the evaporation of the moisture in their lungs. Okay, now remember we're partners, so I'm going to interrupt her here because panting is a term usually reserved for mammals, but in birds there's a better term. <coughs> See how we're partners? Mm -hmm. Anybody know? Anybody taking it? Okay, look at this over here. Fluttery. Fluttery, that's half it. Lure. Lure, flutter. G U L A R. G U L A R, flutter, two words. Uh, you know, we don't have a whole lot of uh, stuff on poultry in most of our courses, unfortunately. Uh, but blue or flutter is the preferred term. Panting is fine, but blue or flutter is maybe a little better. And if you read it someplace, then you'll know what it is. It's the same panting and poultry, blue or flutter. Okay. Um, also, when birds are hot, they'll spread their wings, which increases the amount of surface area, and it increases convection because you have all that cold air that can flow under the wings. Um, they'll also drink more water, as most animals will, because it can cool the body internally. Um, a fun one with poultry that I like is the common waddles are external temperature regulators. So when it's hot, they'll actually increase the vasodilation in their common waddles. Um, it's especially noticeable in like roosters since they have larger common waddles. So they'll increase how much red um, blood is flowing through the common waddles because then that hot blood is interacting with the cool air and cooling down when it goes back to the body. Um, and then they'll do conduction through like in a commercial environment by like leaning against structures like the coop or the side. Um, but birds who have access to like litter or dust will dust bathe because then they can get all that cool dirt. Um, all over their body, which is increased surface area. Um, so this picture just kind of shows it all together. Um, now if you want to use your mouse and point things, that's fine. So you have the convection, which is just the surrounding air. So when they open up their wings, uh, the vasodilation of the cone waddles, um, radiation just by being near these cooler objects, <coughs> um, the evaporative cooling um, through the breathing, and then the conduction to the floor or like the wall. Um, and then something I found was interesting is I found a diagram that related temperature and humidity stress for laying hens. And it kind of shows like why it's important to know what your birds are doing to know like how like heat stress they're getting um, and to make sure like you have like things like clean water or moving air because like they can handle up to about 79 degrees if there's low humidity, but like Indiana has high humidity, so like at lower temperatures, they're going to start to get heat stressed um, earlier. I like that table because it's got the degrees F and degrees C right there. You don't have to do the conversion like we were doing last Monday. And then those are just my sources. Okay. Anybody have any comments or questions on poultry? It, uh, <clears throat> summertime is crazy. Anybody ever work at a commercial poultry laying or growing facility? Because what happens is, unfortunately, if it gets very warm, birds start dying. Anybody ever work in those places? Tell me, have you ever seen that happen? Yeah. Tell I've me. Purdue turkey barns. Purdue they, turkey barns. Yeah, so if it gets too hot, they, they do that one fluttering stuff and they start leaning against them. Because we have to open up a big, all the ventilation throughout the whole system, and there's huge fans all over the place. But birds still die. Yeah. Can Not you tell a lot. Me? Usually, like one a week. One a week, okay. Yeah, but there's like 600 birds there. Yeah. <clears throat> in the commercial places where there's like thousands in a barn, it is not uncommon on a very hot day to have 100 chickens die. Easy. I mean, I'm saying that not easy, that's good, no, it's easy, a hundred birds will die. It's just a lot of density. You can give them like a game mixture to help in the summer. It's yeah. like basically just like power rage for birds. Mm -hmm. You can put it in their waters. <clears throat> 
so it, it is kind of a problem in the summer, very hot. It's hard to cool them off. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, Monday too, that's great. Okay, well, long as this is flowing here, and one of the TAs got this started, I wanted to make a note on uh, something that's missing under thermal regulation. One of you guys sent me an email yesterday that one of the links wasn't working. I think it was called brain cooling. And it, when I made those links, or I checked them a couple weeks ago, they were all working. But the brain cooling one quit working, and when the links are external, I have nothing to do with you know, those sites. You know? So if somebody reorganized the site, I couldn't find the brain cooling <coughs> article that I had linked to. They change their thing. So then it disappeared. I just took it off yesterday. So if you're, you said, where's brain cooling? Well, it's gone now because I couldn't find where it was. It was at some, it was at some journal, scientific journal that was good. But so then I want to just reiterate a little bit on the brain cooling because I'm sure it was about the carotid reading. So I'm going to use this room as an example of what the carotid reading is because you should be able to explain what it is because it works great in sheep. Somewhat in camels, I think the video talks about what animals. It doesn't, you know, like the dogs basically don't have a carotid reading. But here's what the carotid reading is again. First of all, you have a cavernous sinus. That's what this room is. It's a cavernous sinus. And think of this whole room filled with venous blood. It comes in that door over there by Sean. And it's coming from the nasal cavities, right? So when you're breathing, the air is cooling the nasal passages, right? So the blood that's going through the nasal cavities is cooling off. It's coming in that door over there. It fills this room, and it's always flowing. And then it goes out that other door over there by Christian. So this whole room is full of cool, relatively cool, venous blood that's flowing from the nasal cavity. Remember, we're talking about shunting. You've, can, more blood can flow here, or it can bypass this area, depending on how the temperature is outside. Well, then, we, so that I'm only talking about venous now. But now, here's how the arterial uh, reading works, the carotid reading. Blood's coming up from the chest cavity, it branches off the aorta to the carotid. Carotid uh, arteries are bilateral. There's one on both sides of the neck, and I got an interesting little story about how I met somebody that their, one of their carotid arteries wasn't working. Because uh, it's bilateral and they're redundant. They're both sending blood to the brain, but you could actually clamp one off, and the brain would still be okay because you've got two supplies. So then imagine over here there's a pipe that's coming in the wall by me, one big pipe. But as soon as it enters a room, it splits off into a thousand little pipes. And that's all over this room. And then when it gets to the other wall over there by Aaron, all those thousand pipes go back into one and exit that way. So you have this relatively warm arterial blood coming in. It gets spread out to all these pipes, and that increases surface area. You notice that's another theme because Joanna said increasing surface area. So you increase the surface area of the arterial blood that's exposed to the venous blood. And notice how everything's flowing, but there's no mixing of blood, right? Uh -uh. The pipes are there and, and it, it, it exits that way. But there's gonna be uh, heat loss through the wall of the arteries, the reed, from the lumen of the reedy arterial vessels into the venous blood that's in this cavernous sinus, right? And so you've got this going on, so it's very efficient. Because surface area, remember how it is? It affects all of those heat transfer mechanisms that we talked about. So that's the carotid reading. It's like the radiator in your car. If you've ever noticed, there's one big pipe that comes out of the engine that goes to the top of the radiator. But the radiator isn't one pipe. It branches off to, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred little pipes that go down the radiator. Air is flowing through it, because now you've got increased surface area. But at the bottom of the radiator, everything comes back to one pipe. 
and goes back into the engine. Hopefully cool. And if you want to know how good your radiator is working, you could use this. You measure the wall of the pipe that's going into the radiator, the temperature, and then the wall of the pipe that's bringing everything back. There better be a temperature difference, right? Hot going in, at least a lower temperature coming out. You could use that. Okay, so that's the crowded reading. So we're doing, we've been, Monday we started talking about things that happens physiologically. Not that the animal has a conscious play in it. So we did the carotid reading, and we did counter current heat exchange when blood vessels are carrying blood in two different directions and heat is being transferred from the warmer one to the cooler one. Okay? Anybody else? So that's number two. What should number three be? Tell me what from your knowledge, what other things are physiological mechanisms that animals use unconsciously to uh, deal with temperature? Because the reason I'm saying unconsciously is the next thing we're going to talk about is behavior, animal behavior. Like Joanna had one about leaning. But let's do the physiological mechanism. So all these, this high brain power out here, what other things do animals do physiologically to deal with temperature, whether it's very warm or very cold. But don't tell me about behavior, we're gonna, that's our next topic. Sweat. Sweat, yeah, sweating. Now sweating is different because you different than panting. Because I guess that'd be a, uh, number four is panting. Right now I'm panting because you don't, you know, dogs don't say, I'm going to stop panting. And, but sweating, uh, what's the best example of an animal that sweats a lot? Horse. Horse. Beautiful example. And people. And then there's not a lot of other animals that sweat. Sweating is not a big thing in the animal kingdom. Okay? When an animal sweats, like we do, or a horse, you lose water and ions. Okay? So you've got to replenish the ions and the moisture if you're sweating a lot. Like if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, you are always got a water bottle along because it's going to be 110 degrees, and you don't see the sweat because as soon as any moisture appears on your skin, oof, it's gone. It's, the humidity is... 8%. In Indiana, it stays on our skin because if it's very humid, sweating isn't very efficient because you don't evaporate. Okay? So, sweating. Number four, panting. You know what elephants sweat? Do elephants sweat? Help me. Molly, help me. Anything? No? Okay. Um, they might have some functional sweat glands. I don't know. Maybe the TAs can look up. Do elephants sweat? I don't know. Anybody? They don't have sweat glands. What's that? They apparently don't have sweat glands. Okay. Okay. So none at all. So like, you know, dogs don't sweat, but you know what? They have some sweat glands on their feet, the pads of their feet, if you ever, you've seen that. So a lot of animals have some little tiny sweat glands, but not functional. So the elephant has no sweat glands. What they do instead is they'll take water up into the trunk and then splash it back on. Oh, yeah, 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 they have other things. So, no, that's kind of behavior. We're going to get to behavior. But, yeah, there's a lot of things animals can do behavior-wise. So, panting, that's our number four. It's evaporation of water, but you don't lose any ions. You don't tend to lose ions when you can't. Sweating, water loss, and ion loss. Panting. Water loss, not really so much ions. Okay, how about number five? Don't animals with fur also change their, I mean, they don't have conscious control over changing their coats, but they do have different coats for the seasons. Okay, yeah, that's over, that's kind of like a long-term thing. Yeah, like, you know, if you're familiar with horses, they have like their winter coat. So I guess that could be number five, because that's not, you don't, you don't say, I'm going to grow a winter coat. Right? So, yeah, okay, the uh, length and density of the hair coat can change over a season. Yeah. That's good. So, number six. 
Yeah, I'll go over here. Like laying somewhere cool. Okay, that's behavior though. Okay, but here we had shivering. Okay, yes. Shivering because it's isotonic contraction of muscles. Isotonic. You're not moving anything like an arm, right? Shivering is just muscles contracting, relaxing. But as soon as you move muscles, you generate heat. So shivering is a way to generate heat, and you don't really consciously say, I'm going to shiver, or I'm not going to shiver. So was that number five? So that's six. OK, now we're in seven. So these are physiological mechanisms that animal, animals undergo, but it's, they're not consciously aware of it. Yes? Goosebumps, yes, put that down, number seven. Now, if you went to IU, you would say goosebumps. But at Purdue, we use the technical term. Pilo erection. That's all one word. So how many experience a pilo erection this morning? No one's going to admit it. OK, that's fine. OK, good, thank you. <laughs> P-I-L-O, erection, all one word. So, yes. Okay, number eight. Okay, she, she said increasing or decreasing, like, digestion. Okay. What's that? Rumen movement. Yes, let's see how we can work that into it. Um, I guess you can in a little way. In a, in a, here's how we can do that. You know, you can't consciously say, I'm going to shun blood to the digestive tract or not. That happens after a meal, right? The postprandial thermal genesis. But think of this, the fight or flight system. When that's activated, it shunts blood away from your digestive tract. So see how I'm trying to work that in with us? Uh, it's kind of an extreme example, but something you don't consciously do. But if you're in the flight or fight uh, mechanism, blood is shunted away from your digestive tract, and it's sent more to muscles. Because you're either going to fight or you're going to run. And muscles need more blood supply then. And you don't have to worry about digesting food because you might die, right? The fight or flight system is ready to do that. So that's kind of how that would work in. Okay, so number eight. Anybody else have a? Oh, number nine, thank you. I can't tell. Here we go. What about like um, digestion of fat or something related? Well, okay. Yeah. And uh, we won't write this down as number nine, but she's talking about how what the diet is made of can somewhat influence how much heat is produced digesting that food, okay? So that's a, like a little sidebar. I'm not sure where to put that, but here it is. High concentrate diets are easier to digest than high roughage diets. So let's say a cow, two cows. One's eating a high concentrate diet. That cow will have less heat increment than a cow that's eating straw. Okay, so there's a little bit of influence of how your diet affects. So sometimes, um, uh, like in the summertime, you might make, a, for cattle, you might make, decrease the roughage because then you'll know that they'll be producing less heat when they're eating. But that's, you know, kind of stretching a little bit, but it's true, yes? Um. Okay, so like, are you talking? So give me an example. Do you have an example? Okay, rabbit feeding rabbit is what a cool or a hot diet? Okay. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Maybe by Monday, look up. Could you? Bring and say, here's what this does lower, this does higher. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if it's a, um, a function of the amount of water in the meat. I'm not sure. Because if there's a lot of water, it'd be 
easier to digest, right? You don't really digest well. So if some meat has a higher dry matter content, it would cause more digestion, more heat. I don't know. Look, you, Anna will tell us one day. Okay. Um, uh, Pam Pinnipon plexus, where they, the, in the testes, they'll resend their testes into the body when it gets too cold or too hot to regulate the temperature. Okay, well, she said the Pan Pinnipon plexus. We should write that down because actually that mechanism is for heat exchange. Yeah, and the testes can increase and decrease in there, well, go up or down, right. Okay, so Pam Pinnipon plexus. Let's see if we can spell that. P A M, I know that. P I N A F O R M, right? Pan Pinniform? You, you spellers, is that right? Pan. No? I need another I? Yeah. After the N? Okay. P A M P I N I, Pan Pin uh, Form. Okay. Plexus, P L E X U S. Thank you. That's a mechanism that's above the testes that cools arterial blood before it gets to the testes. So that's good, yeah. Because that's going to be working unconsciously, obviously. The pan pinniform plexus. But then, so what number was that? Hmm? That was 10? So number 11 would be the testes can alter their position. Colder, go up towards the abdominal cavity. Warmer, go down lower, away from the abdominal cavity, right? Anybody remember what muscle does that? Somebody tell me. There's a muscle that does that, or a mechanism. And right offhand, I can't recall it. I want to say tunica dorticos, but I'm not sure. Anybody? Yeah, it might be the cremaster muscle, one of those two. We'll look that up for uh, Monday, okay? But anyway, the testes goes up and down, right? Okay, anything else that animals do unconsciously, away from behavior? Well, yeah, okay, vasodilation, vasoconstriction slash shunting of surface blood vessels. Right, yeah. So here it is. When you're warm or an animal's warm, blood is shunted more towards the surface blood vessels. Okay, that's called shunting. But if it's cold, then you tend to shunt more blood deeper into the tissue and away from the surface, right? Because if you're hot, you can get rid of heat. But if you're cold, you don't want your warm arterial blood to be near the surface. So that's what number is that? 11. So 11 was shunting slash vasodilation, because it's all based on vasodilation, vasoconstriction, right? Shunting is the result of that. Yes? So like when you're heat stressed and your blood goes out towards the surface, um, you can have some like hypoxia within the, like the, the visceral organs, is that correct? Uh, well, I don't... Like they'll die off because they don't have any well, no, it's not that extreme. You're going to shunt more blood to the surface, but every or every tissue is still going to get a good blood supply. What if you die from heat stress? Is that what you like? Oh, if you die from heat stress. Is that or, part of it? Is that what you, like, part of dying from heat stress? Uh, no, not really. It's dying from heat stress, right? Hyperthermia. That's other other things going on. You know, tissue dying because then there's a nice little normal range that your tissue wants to go into. Yeah. So that's different. Okay. Anything else that animals do unconsciously? Here we go. Um, would hibernation be one? Hibernation? Okay. <clears throat> Let's break that down and she's talking about hibernating animals. Because I'm not sure if that should be a behavior or a physiological mechanism, right? None of our domestic animals hibernate, right? So we don't really study that much, but obviously bears. Do bears, tru bears truly hibernate, right? You go, they go into some place and their body temperature lowers, okay? But, so, I'm not sure if they, I guess they use seasonal clues and stuff like that, so it might be physiological slash behavior, okay? Okay, other things? 
before we go to behavior mechanisms, what animals consciously do, I guess. Let me reset my camera here for a second. Okay, behavior number one. Let's hear it, crowd. We're tapping your brain. You can't just sit there like lumps on the lawn. Think of all the animals you work with. What do they do when they either get cold or warm? Lay out in the sun. Okay, so lay out in the sun. Okay, if you're an animal and you're cold and it's sunny versus a shaded area, you go to the sunny area because you're going to get radiant heat. Right? And a black dog, for example, would absorb more heat than a white dog. Okay? So they're changing where they lay. They're, they're selecting. Now here's the other thing is, when you work with animals, the more things they can select, the better they're going to be in their comfort zone. Right? But if a dog is chained out in the backyard and there's no trees, can it find shade? Can it, you know? No, it can't. It's stuck. But you can seek out shade, that's what we're talking about, or sun, depending on the situation. Um, this is probably more like this is skin protected, but like rolling around in the eyes or maybe Okay, so number two, the behavior. There is a term for that. Wallowing. W-A-L-L-O-W-I-N-G, wallowing. Pigs are famous for this, given the opportunity, of course. I mean, if they're in a pen in the barn, there's no wallowing. But pigs will, if, you know, pigs can be raised in a, on a pasture. You guys know that? Pigs are technically a hindgut fermenter. Their sedum can digest roughage. And I've never seen any happier pigs than out on pasture where there's some mud. Because if it gets hot, they wallow. And they get coated with mud. And they're, they're in the water. And they're conducting a lot of heat to the earth out of that body. Okay? So give them a chance. Wallowing. Yeah. So that's number two. Three. Um, it's kind of similar to wallowing, but our alpacas like, roll so that it opens up like their, their fleece like, will open up to get more air. Okay. So the alpacas roll in dust or dirt, whatever. Do uh, llamas do that too then? Yeah, so I they, do. Llamas and alpacas will roll around in the dust. Uh, how about horses? Do they do that? Oh my gosh, yes. They're always rolling around, it seems like, if you give them the right environment. So that's number, that was number three, sorry, number four. A burrowing underground. Burrowing underground, yes. Using that cool heat. So that would be like, I guess you could even get out of the cold that way too. Burrowing underground for some animals. Most of our domestic animals don't do that, but yes, some of the wild animals do burrow. Okay. Crowding or isolation? Okay, so is this number five? Okay, so you're saying animals will crowd together when they're cold, yeah. when they're cold and that's really called um, huddling. And what's it called in the human population? <laughs> Cuddling. Thank you, we did that a while ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, huddle. Because here's the deal. And they do this out in Nebraska, the cattle. It's really cold. They get together. And when, here's what happens. When you're standing <coughs> next to a cow, your favorite cow, hopefully, and your bodies are touching, that surface area is now not exposed to the environment. So you decrease your effective surface area when you huddle together. And that would happen in the cold, right? What happens in the hot? Just the opposite. Don't touch me, right? You spread out. I don't want to be by you, right? And dogs do that. I know one, at one time I peeked out at five dogs. My wife said, and then we had four cats. And my wife said, if we go to double, if we go to double digits, I'm moving to town. <laughs> so we had five dogs and four cats at one time. Anyway, when it was cold, they're sleeping in a pile, because they were all outside of In the hot summer, they're 20 feet apart. You know, that's huddling. OK, another behavior. What about nest building? What's that? Nest building. Nest building. OK, so I guess you could, you know, because oh, I'm thinking of pigs outside. You know, they kind of like to build a nest, I guess. And that could conserve some heat, so yes. Is that number five? 